Hello and welcome to the Dorkomotive Podcast with Brian Loans. On this episode, we're going to talk about the life and rocket-propelled times of a man named Captain Jack McClure. We're talking about a guy who made his living for several years riding a 200-plus-mile-per-hour hydrogen peroxide-powered go-kart. He did this at drag strips across America, and the man is still alive today at nearly 90 years old, having lived one of the most exciting lives in motorsports. This is the story of Captain Jack. Welcome back to the Dorkomotive Podcast, and welcome to an episode about a guy. This is a bit different than what we've done in the past. We've done episodes about racing accomplishments and done episodes about uh, machines, but this particular show is going to be about a guy. And this is not a guy we need to talk about in the past tense. Amazingly, Captain Jack McClure is still alive, and he is 90, 91 years old, something in that area. And when you hear about his life and and all the things that he did and continues to do, um, it becomes kind of even more amazing that he's still around to to tell some of these stories firsthand. Thankful that I've been able to become friendly with Captain Jack over the course of time, been able to tell his life story um, in written form on Bankshift.com, where I serve as the editor-in-chief, and uh, have just had a lot of good times talking with him on the phone, kind of uh, hearing about some of the crazy things that he's done and accomplished. So uh, when we talk about this guy, he was an exhibition performer, most famously um, at drag strips, but it really takes away a lot uh, when we say that when you say he's just an exhibition performer at drag strips it tends to take away a lot of other history and other things that he did so when we tell the story of Captain Jack we're going to build to this crescendo of how he is becomes most famous with this rocket powered go-kart and when I tell you it was a go-kart I mean it was a go-kart that would go through the quarter mile in in six seconds uh, at over 200 miles an hour sometimes 215 to 20 depending on how he set it up and all this was done in the early 1970s and it was the culmination of a lifetime of motorsport competition and really of daredevil type things that that Jack McClure was involved in and to kind of start off with Jack McClure's racing life we go back to Columbia Speedway in South Carolina we go back to the late 1940s and early 1950s and that is where we find this young man named Captain Jack McClure who is long not named the captain yet he's just a kid really named Jack McClure who is racing at this circle track um, called Columbia Speedway and when we talk about Columbia Speedway and we talk about Columbia Speedway at this time in history this is where guys like Richard Petty and Buck Baker and the greatest names that built NASCAR stock car racing came along and Jack was banging fenders with these guys every week before anybody knew who they were. He was just, again, he was just a kid out there racing these jalopies, these old coupes, and he was hammering on fenders with Junior Johnson and Rick, Richard Petty and Buck Baker and, um, again, guys like Curtis Turner and others would show up at Columbia Speedway and race. And to give you a little insight into uh, McClure and his storytelling ability, they raced on Thursday nights at this particular racetrack and I was curious when Jack was telling me the story why Thursday it seems like an odd night most racetracks Friday night tracks Saturday night track or they run Sunday days and he said um, the speedway was very close to a military installation and the military guys all got paid on Thursday and so the track operator uh, being shrewd like most track operators are decided that Thursday was going to be his time to race because they all had a fresh paycheck in their pocket. They could come out, buy a ticket, buy a grandstand seat, buy a couple of beers with their buddies, and they would probably be tapped out by the time they got to Sunday. So if you got them on Thursday, um, you at least could make sure you filled the stands. Jack suffered the same fate as so many young racers where he simply ran out of money. Um, did not have the money to advance much past what he was doing with the jalopies. Watched other guys around him figure out sponsorship and figure out how to have nicer equipment, and he just could never put it together. So Jack's stock car racing career ended before it started, and he needed something that was, one, going to make him some money, and two, something that was going to play to his skill set. He was a good racer, but he just didn't have the budget to complete compete on that bigger larger stage in the world of stock car racing so that is where jack's life took an interesting turn always loved the water and he started uh spending a lot of time on it working on boats and he bought a boat went into the charter fishing business and was able to grow that into a successful business he was not named captain jack mcclure because he looked like a space cadet on his rocket powered go-kart he was named that because he was an actual boat captain an actual licensed captain of boats which he still is today i'm not sure 
how active he is in boating anymore because of his age, but he spent uh, many years either at racetracks or on the water, and when he wasn't doing one, he was kind of doing the other. So understand when we talk about Captain Jack McClure, the Captain Jack part comes from the fact that he was an actual nautical captain, and you'll understand why he would need those breaks for his mental sanity after we get into the next part of his story where we really start to see who Captain Jack McClure is and what his kind of life goal will end up being and how he will achieve it. So Captain Jack McClure, failed local stock car racer, happy boat captain, and soon to be king of the go-kart racers. So it's impossible to overstate how popular go-karting became in the United States um, in the late 1950s and into the 60s. It it became like a national craze. And today we understand that go-kart racing is the entry point for really any serious race car driver kid. When we look at any pro pro driver really uh, at this point in the year 2020, we see a kid that came through go-karts and quarter midgets and drove everything on the way up. But back in the late 50s, the go-karts were not kids' toys. They were a way for adults that wanted to go racing that didn't have the money to have a full-on operation to go compete. And this was um, something that Jack really found himself. He fell in love with go-kart racing. And not only did he fall in love with it, he became very, very good at it. So Mickey Rupp, Rupp Go-Karts, was one of the most famous names in go-karting in this kind of golden era of the sport. And after Jack won some races and became very successful, Mickey Rupp called Jack, and Jack became the lead distributor for all Rupp go-karts in the southern United States, which this was a very lucrative business, um, selling hundreds if not thousands of these things a year. Uh, Jack was making some real money, and he was racing all over the country and winning. So go-karting, like every other motorsport, evolves when it started. Guys would just have a little single engine on it. Then they went to dual engine carts. So this twin engine cart that Jack had with these two kind of gnarly hot rodded engines um, could actually run about 100 miles an hour in the quarter mile. Jack took this thing to a drag strip and and ran it at 100. He said, Jesus, this is kind of cool. So he told Mickey Rupp about it. So Rupp built him a four engine go kart. Now these are four small single cylinder engines, but four engines across the back and the thing went 125 in the quarter mile. So, um, Pretty neat stuff here for Jack. He's getting the sensation of speed. No one's really going that fast in one of these things. And again, you're a grown man sitting on top of a go-kart. So you're kind of all piled on top of this thing and your legs are all splayed out. And it looks weird enough as it is when you're racing around a parking lot or a short road course. It looks doubly, triply weird when you're going 125 miles an hour on this thing with its four engines across the back. And it was at this point that Jack heard about a company in Florida selling compact rocket engines. Now, this is, again, the early 1960s, where in America, uh, if you wanted to have a company that uh, sold compact rocket engines, you could just go ahead and do that. And a guy named Gene Middlebrooks decided to do exactly that. He developed a company called Turbonique. And Turbonique is a company that is, um, let's say it is it is very long kind of, it's infamous, and it's very infamous because of its beginning, middle, and end. So Turbonique begins by selling these compact rocket engines. He advertises them as a way to power go-karts, not for competition, because again, it is a rocket engine, but for drag racing, for other types of recreational activities, you could put one of his rocket engines on your go-kart and go out there and rip down the drag strip or whatever else you wanted to do. Knowing at the time, there is no rules against any of this stuff. Most drag strips in the early 1960s, uh, if they were even sanctioned at all, it wasn't like there was uh, a lot of people that would tell you not to try something or do something. Great era in the sport, also a very dangerous era in the sport. So, Gene Middlebrooks and Captain Jack McClure get hooked up. Um, He goes down and, and gets one of these engines, goes to Mickey Rupp and goes to Rupp and says, hey, could you build me a cart that I can put one of these rocket engines on? And so he did. And this single rocket engine of Turbonique, which used a fuel called thermaline. So if we can describe briefly how this works, and you can go to Google and find all these pictures. So anything I'm talking about, you can verify with photos. As insane as all this sounds, it is a real thing that happened and is historically documented. So the way that the Turbonique rocket engines worked was there, you have a kind of a small like welding tank full of this this gas that was marketed as being called thermaline. It was a 
uh, made up name by Gene Middlebrooks and the company. It was basically propylene oxide, which is a very um, <laughs> don't mess around with this type of stuff substance. So what you would do is you would pressurize the propylene oxide, shoot it into this little chamber. There'd be a spark plug that would ignite it. And then the combustion would be forced out of the tail of it, creating thrust that would send you down the racetrack and it would make a big noise and off you went. Made about 300 pounds of thrust. So McClure gets this thing. It looks like a death trap. It is a little go-kart with this little rocket engine on the back. And I asked Jack about it. I said, what was it like the first time you hit the throttle on this thing? You're talking about 300 pounds of thrust. And what Jack's exact quote to me was, it was disappointing. He said, it made a big noise. And I heard later that a lot of the people at the food stand kind of dropped what was in their hands, but it barely went faster than my four-engine cart. I only made one pass and decided to ship it back down to Turbonique to have a second rocket engine added. The second engine made the cart into a 150-mile-an-hour quarter-mile pass runner, and that was pretty good for the time period, and I was able to tour around and run a lot at drag strips with it. There is video of Jack McClure on YouTube running this cart, racing full-size cars. Most famously, there's a picture taken of him in 1964, which I put on my Instagram page, that includes... He, Jack McClure is in his rocket cart with these two Turbonique engines, little rocket motors, and next to him is Tommy Ivo smoking the tires in his top fuel car trying to catch Captain Jack McClure. Again, this was shot at Tampa Dragway in 1964. To this day, if you bring this photo up to Captain Jack McClure, he doubles over with laughter. If you bring it up to TV Tommy Ivo, he wants to hit you with a phone book. Why? The go-kart was broken. The track operator positioned the go-kart down the course to make it look like it was running away from the top fueler. You can see McClure kind of hunkered over the wheel. He's sitting completely still. Ivo is basically making a solo pass, but for the purposes of a publicity stunt, the photo worked brilliantly, and it worked very good to be able to extend the bookings for Captain Jack McClure. The racetrack got a ton of publicity out of it, and TV Tommy Ivo was made to look as though he was losing to this little rocket-powered go-kart when, in fact, the go-kart was dead in the water. So make sure you go to uh, look up some of the video on that stuff. It is kind of an amazing deal. Now, the interesting thing is that this go-kart really was the start of something for McClure, but it wasn't the end. I mean, his he's going to have this rocket-powered go-kart for a couple of years. He's going to travel around the country with it. Um, he was actually able to meet a guy named Joey Chitwood while he had this thing, and Joey Chitwood had the Joey Chitwood Thrill Show, which was an amazingly popular event. Many of you, including uh, people my age, I'm, I just turned 40 on the day of making this podcast, uh, we saw the Joey Chitwood stunt drivers at, at fairs. We saw them at different events. Many of you, as a childhood, if you grew up uh, with gearhead parents or you grew up doing some, some gearhead-type stuff, probably saw the Joey Chitwood stunt show at some point. So... After he's touring with the, the Rocket Go-Kart for a while, things are going well. He runs into Joey Chitwood. The two have this meeting, and it gets a ride, or it should say it gets Captain Jack a ride in one of the most bizarre drag racing exhibition vehicles of all time and a bizarre drag racing exhibition vehicle that nearly killed him. The next part of the story is Captain Jack driving the Sizzler. So the next thing that Captain Jack gets involved with after he gets famous driving this Turbonique rocket go-kart is um, this car called the Sizzler. And the Sizzler was a 1965 Z16 Chevelle, which is like, right now, a Z16 Chevelle is worth the big money. It had a, a 396 engine, the big horsepower 396, saw lifter cam, a uh, very rare version of the 65 Chevelle. Now, this car was different in the fact that it was also equipped with what is known as a Turbonique rocket drag axle. And if the Turbonique uh, rocket go-kart was not a weird enough idea, Middlebrooks develops this product called the Rocket Drag Axle, of which he sells several and of which you can find video and photos of cars running them. The Rocket Drag Axle basically had a rocket motor that would fire and uh, spin a, um, uh, effectively spin a turbine wheel and that turbine wheel would then drive the rear axle. So when you watch a car with a Turbonique rocket drag axle go down the racetrack, it is not being driven down the track by thrust. It is actually being wheel driven down the track, and the wheel is being the wheels are being spun by this rocket engine. It's a really crazy design. Um, it made 
insane amounts of power. And when it worked correctly, stock bodied cars that had these things on them would run incredible speeds in ETs, uh, stuff that really nothing else could touch at the time. Um, McClure ran that Sizzler for one season, um, and this was his quote for him. I think I ran 25 or 30 dates with the Sizzler. The car was a real Z16 Chevelle that had one of the Turbonique rocket drag axles in it. The big problem is that all the Turbonique stuff was shit and didn't hold up. Gene Middlebrooks had lots of ideas of, and designs, but the stuff was always on the verge of breaking or failing. I had no idea how dangerous the Turbonique rocket cart was until a few years after the fact, and I looked back on my time with it and thought how lucky I was that the thing didn't blow up. So the car was able to be driven around on the regular engine and transmission, but you didn't use that on the strip. On the track, I would put the car in neutral, hit the button, and drive the Chevelle down the track with the rocket drag axle providing the power, smoking the tires all the way down. The way the rocket drag axle worked was pretty simple. And again, this is in the words of Captain Jack McClure. There was a rocket engine that was ignited when I hit the button. The thrust from the rocket engine would spin a big turbine wheel, which was attached to some planetary gears that spun the axles and drove the car. The problem was that the gears and the turbine wheels couldn't hold up to the abuse, and I had a couple of the turbine wheels break and even melt on me. All this came to an end when I went through the lights at 162 miles an hour, the turbine wheel melted, and locked the whole works up tight. I was told the car rolled 12 times. I was lucky not to be killed, and I was done with anything ever to do with Turbonique. Incredible. He rolls this Chevelle 12 times. The drag axle basically melts itself, welds itself together at the top end, locks the rear end up, destroys him, uh, his car, nearly kills him. And remember, this is in the days when nothing really had a great like, roll bar in it, just kind of just kind of pipe that was welded in there. The fact that it rolled 12 times and didn't kill him is uh, is astonishing. And you can see video. I should, should not say video. You can see still photos of the Sizzler. Um, on Google Images, and you'll see a giant amount of fire coming out of it, and you'll see the rocket drag axle located beneath the car. But again, drive it to the staging lanes on the motor, and then put the thing in neutral, hit the button, and let the rocket drag axle do the rest of the work. When the car crashed, it opened up a great door for Captain Jack McClure, because when Joey Chitwood heard that the Chevelle was over with, he told me that, uh, this is again in Jack's words, he told me he was sad to hear about the car, but glad to hear that I was free. I spent the next six years as a driver for the Chitwood Thrill Show. So during that time period, you know, Chitwood is, a, is again, we have a guy who has now been a pretty accomplished drag racer, has, has driven go-karts at a, at a competitive level um, across the country, has made a name for himself there. And now we learn how good a racer this guy really is because in 1967, on top of all this stuff he's already done, in 1967, Jack McClure and Joey Chitwood Jr. compete in the 1967 24 Hours of Daytona in a brand new 67 Z28 Camaro. So we're talking 302, four-speed, roll bar, the works. They actually qualified well. They were leading their class for some of the race, and they were switching off. You know, McClure and Chitwood Jr. were driving in shifts. So... Again, the 24 Hours of Daytona, even in 1967, drew premier road racing talent. Now, granted, these guys weren't racing in the upper highest echelon, but they were competing against the best people in the country and the best people in the world, and they were leading the race at that point. Unfortunately, during the middle of the night, McClure is driving the car on the high banks and uh, loses the entire electrical system. This is even weirder than it would be in normal times and in modern times because there was no lights on the track back then. So McClure, the entire electrical system fails, and you're basically invisible at that point. Daytona was not lit in 1967, okay? So the only light you had was from competitors, some of which on the banking are going close to 200, and they can't see you until they get on top of you with their headlights. So he was able to get the car back into the pits, and he said, we swapped out the alternator, got back on the track, but about 3 a.m. while we were leading our class, there was an electrical fire in the car, and that was it. Our goal was to have a good showing for Chevrolet and race hard. We did that. It was a lot of fun. Not many people know I did that. Again, the words of Captain Jack McClure. So if you're questioning this story and its veracity, you can Google it, and you can find the result sheet where they finished uh, a DNF, the official record of the 67 24 Hours of Daytona, have both Chitwood and Jack McClure listed as the driver's of their Camaro. So that's 1967. He races at that. They lose. They're gone. Decides that the kind of life of a 
go-kart driving, stunt driving, thrill show competitor is not really for him anymore, so he goes back out to the water. And he fishes, and he captains boats, and he relaxes. But the bug can't go away. The bug won't go away. He needs to come back and do something involving speed. And we get to right around 1968-69 when a phenomenon in drag racing has begun that will take the sport, not not necessarily by storm, but take it by surprise. And this phenomenon is the hydrogen peroxide rocket funny car and hydrogen peroxide rocket dragster. For the period of the next five or six years in drag racing, it will be astonishing to see what people do with these rocket-powered machines that don't use fire and flame, but use an odd industrial chemical and a silver screen to run speeds and elapsed time no one's ever thought of before, no one even thought possible before. But for Captain Jack McClure, it's not a rocket dragster he's interested in, or even a rocket funny car. Captain Jack McClure has the idea to build a rocket-powered go-kart, the likes of which the world has never seen before or since. So when we talk about hydrogen peroxide rockets, you really need to understand how they work before we get into the actual vehicle that Jack McClure drove to fame. Hydrogen peroxide rockets use hydrogen peroxide as the main fuel. They don't use any other fuel source. That's it. And you may think, well, what is uh, so great about hydrogen peroxide? For starters, it has to be 100% pure hydrogen peroxide. And the stuff you buy at the store, um, the stuff you, you know, people dye their hair with or whatnot, that stuff's like 1%. It is uh, it is still kind of gnarly stuff, but it is not anything near what 100% pure hydrogen peroxide is. In fact, you basically cannot get 100% pure hydrogen peroxide on U.S. shores anymore. You have to import it. No one in this country... Uh, or even on the North American continent, in my understanding, actually manufactures this stuff anymore. And when we talk about it, it's not volatile in terms of explosiveness. It is very volatile in terms of handling. So if you dump hydrogen peroxide in a pure form on any organic object, such as a leather glove or your hand or wood, you pick it, on an organic substance, uh, things start to happen very quickly and that are very negative, especially if this substance is attached to you. So there is video you can find online of 100% hydrogen peroxide being dumped on a leather glove, and basically that thing starts to smoke and bubble and gurgle and um, react to it instantaneously. It's a very strange chemical in in the way that it interacts with other organic matter. Again, High, not that highly flammable. We're not. We don't even talk about flame when we talk about how, how a hydrogen peroxide rocket works. The simplicity of the hydrogen peroxide rocket is why they became popular in drag racing, became a viable exhibition vehicle. How this worked was very easy. You had a tank of hydrogen peroxide that was pressurized. Okay, so you got all this hydrogen peroxide waiting to go, trying to go somewhere. You have a small orifice. You're going to force it through, and on the end of that orifice you have a screen that is coated in silver. As soon as hydrogen peroxide touches silver, it turns into steam immediately, instantaneously. It is an instantaneous reaction. So when you take this steam, which is expanding very fast, and you force it through your nozzle at the end of the rocket engine, that's what gives you the thrust. So this is a steam rocket, a chemical steam rocket. One more time, tank of peroxide, under pressure, trying to get somewhere. We put a little valve in there, and when we press on the throttle, we open that valve. The pressurized peroxide shoots out, hits our silver screen, expands in a steam. We harness that steam by forcing it through a nozzle, and we go rocketing down the racetrack. Guys were running 300 miles an hour in the quarter mile in the early 70s with hydrogen peroxide rocket cars. They weighed nothing. We're talking 900 pounds with a driver in it. They would wheel these things to the starting line. You would literally, they would push the cars to the starting line in total silence because it doesn't make any noise. It's just sitting there, a little bit of little bit of stuff gurgling out of it, maybe a little bit of a pressure regulator release type of situation with some stuff gurgling, but it doesn't make any noise. It doesn't make any flash or dash. They would roll the cars into fully stage position, walk away, and then the crowd would count down and they would blast off, and they would run speeds and ETs that were mind-boggling then, as they are now. If you want to believe the hype, the quickest thing that's ever run down a drag strip is a hydrogen peroxide funny car with with um, Sammy Miller at the wheel in England, like in like three and a half seconds at like 400 miles an hour 30 years ago. 
So when we talk about hydrogen peroxide rockets, now you have a basic understanding of how they work. For Captain Jack McClure, he goes to a guy named Glenn Blakely, who's a chassis builder, and he goes to a guy named Avril Porter, who is kind of the guy who became the, the drag racing authority on rocket hydrogen peroxide rocket engines. So he went to Porter and said, hey, man, I would like you to build me an engine that makes about 1,000 pounds of thrust that I'm going to put on a go-kart. Remember, when he had the twin hydro, when he had the twin Turbonique rocket cart, that thing only had like 300 pounds of thrust. So he's got 1,000 pounds of thrust. He goes to Glenn Blakely, who is a chassis builder. And frankly, um, the fact that neither of these guys told him to, to, to stop calling and leave uh, is amazing to me. You go to Blakely and you say, hey, man, I want you to build me this go-kart that's going to have a rocket engine. And if you're Glenn Blakely, do you not go, ah, man, I really don't know if you want to do that or if I want to do that and have you get killed on this thing and then my name's attached to it. And you go to Avril Porter and you say, hey, man, I'm looking for this rocket engine uh, to put on a go-kart and Porter doesn't go, ah, geez, I don't know if I want to be the one to provide you with the instrument of your own demise, but apparently money talks because both guys did the job. So the first design that McClure considered was kind of a typical sit-up go-kart and then he uh, liked the idea of laying down and then finally went to a full lay-down design and he felt the aerodynamics would be better. He felt it was probably safer to be in that position and basically, the way that they laid this go-kart out, and they only built one because he never crashed this thing. Obviously, if he did, he'd probably be dead. But the way they laid the cart out was very simple. Blakely had him get up on the chassis table and had him kind of lay down in the position he wanted and put some wooden blocks underneath him and then used uh, a bunch of welding rod tacked together to make the basic shape, and he built the go-kart around Captain Jack McClure. It was a tailor-made vehicle that he was sitting in, a tailor-made car go-kart that was built to his exact specifications McClure's old friend Mickey Rupp the go-kart guy looked one took one look at the go-kart and said that it was going to take off and fly at like 175 miles an hour and McClure said he looked me in the eye and said this thing's going to fly and kill you McClure said I don't believe you because how the hell could you know that just by looking at it with a thousand pound rocket motor and no body work aside from some small wings the car went 178 miles an hour on its very first run very first time down the racetrack, 178 miles an hour. That run was made just about late 1969, early 1970. McClure raced this entire this cart the entire time he had it, of course, never crashed it, never had an incident. From 1970 to 73, he was successful in one way or another every time he went down the racetrack. So some specs on the cart. It had actual normal go-kart tires on it, off-the-shelf go-kart tires tubeless tires on six inch rims the fronts are on four inch rims also tubeless he had smaller tires on it to start with but needed bigger tires to help slow the thing down the rear brakes were needed more tire to work correctly he had a five foot diameter deece drag race parachute that was basically a, mo a motorcycle parachute that was uh, mounted to the back the first rocket motor, as I mentioned, 1,000 uh, pounds of thrust design, but then he replaced it with a 1,500-pound thrust design. The cart with Jack McClure on it weighed 400 pounds. Everything all told, 400 pounds. And his feet were the leading edge. Talked about pure hydrogen peroxide. It's basically unavailable in North America today, but back then it was like 10 bucks a gallon. It was expensive to get, and he would have to go to the plant to get it. He would go to FMC Chemical in New York. He would burn four or five gallons of it going down the track, so you're talking about 50, 60 bucks a run, give or take. He would get 30-gallon drums. And he, it was actually the stuff, believe it or not, even though as it was a liquid, it was sold by the pound. It was pretty dense, so it was like 10 bucks a gallon for 300-pound drum. They were sold in these double drums, and Jack talks about driving down the highway, and you could they had these like vents on them and they'd be driving down the highway and all of a sudden one of the drums would kind of start to to gurgle in the back of his van and the vent would go off and pretty amazing stuff the other than the brakes there was basically one moving part for the entire operation which was a ball valve that attached to the throttle pedal as jack described it the only thing that moved on that motor was the ball valve throttle the tank of hydrogen peroxide would be pressurized, and when I opened the ball valve, the pressurized hydrogen peroxide would rush out of the tank across a pack of small silver screens, and those were a catalyst which caused hydrogen peroxide to turn into steam. 
That steam was forced out the nozzle, creating the thrust that shot me down the track. Amazingly, this guy, he didn't just hit the gas and hold on. He actually drove the car. For instance, if I was going for low ET, I would just stand on it and run it as hard as I could. But if the track operator was looking for speed, I would kind of roll into the throttle, saving some fuel and carrying my speed farther. Why was saving fuel a concern? I'll let Jack explain it in his own words again. I didn't change the fuel tanks out when I swapped from the 1,000-pound th thrust motor to the 1,500-pound thrust motor, so the cart would run out of fuel at 1,000 feet if I just stood on it. If that happened, I typically had a better ET, but my speed was down due to the fact that I was coasting further to get to the end of the track. By launching hard off the line, then rolling back the throttle, and then into it again at the top end, I'd be able to undergo power longer at the end of the track, carrying more speed through the lights. An incredible kind of presence of mind when you're laying on your back going 220 plus miles an hour. Any trade did not allow the cart at their racetracks. Banned. Didn't hurt his business at all. He ran at IHRA and AHRA tracks. He went to circle tracks and did shows. He did all kinds of stuff. And then he finally got sponsored, believe it or not, by Amelie Oil Company in the early 70s. And you think, why would Amelie Oil sponsor a vehicle that doesn't use oil? It used grease, and he would use their grease on his bearings and axles. That was really the one major maintenance point that he had to maintain in this thing was greasing the axles and greasing the wheel bearings, make sure everything was happy there. So Emily uh, sponsored him, paid him good money to, to carry their company banner and promote their line of grease. Now, I have some incredible audio here to share with you. Um, this comes from 1973. And what you're going to listen to here is you're actually going to listen to Captain Jack McClure making a run in the Rocket Go-Kart at Orange County International Raceway, one of the most famous drag strips in the world that ever existed, which has long gone out of business now. You're going to hear him making a run, and you're going to hear the announcer, John Lundberg, call the run. And John Lundberg is an incredible man, still alive, uh, arguably the greatest drag racing announcer of all time. He's on, on the level with anybody you've ever heard of, McClellan, Evans, all those guys kind of in that Mount Rushmore of greatness in terms of drag race announcing. So you're going to listen to McClure make the run, and you're going to listen to how John Lundberg describes it, and you're going to remember when you listen to this that there was no such thing as a scoreboard at Orange County International Raceway when this happened. So the magic of this to me when you listen to John Lundberg's call, and listen to it once or twice if you have to, is the way he manipulates the crowd, the way he builds it up, and the way he gives them the, the elapsed time numbers on this. It's, it is, in my opinion, it is art. It is brilliantly done by one of the true masters of the genre. So without further ado, close your eyes, unless you're driving, in which case don't close your eyes, but take yourself back to a warm night at Orange County International Raceway in Southern California in 1973 with one of the most incredible vehicles you've ever seen in your life sitting ahead of you, and listen to John Lundberg call the run. Jack in his preparation tonight is another very prominent rocket driver, John Paxton. Here we go. Blue is ready. Strapped on his backup. <laughs> I mean, how great is that? How great is that when you when you listen to it and you hear nothing and then the whoosh of the rocket and understand it's this little tiny speck of a guy going ripping down the racetrack and then to McClure's, rather to John Lundberg's delivery, which is masterful. You know, again, I mentioned the no scoreboard thing because when he builds up to that elapsed time and he gets to that point where he says he's traversed 1,320 feet in six point and he kind of drags it out. You can hear the crowd almost wanting to come into the tower and tell tell me, you know, you can feel the energy. And then finally he says 6.22 seconds and there is this gasp of of horror and delight and, and astonishment from the crowd, which I think is is amazing. What I need to tell you to make this run even more impressive, and that 6.22 second more impressive elapsed time, is that in 1974, 
the best run a funny car made a year after this was 6.23 seconds. He was the fastest thing in that show. Faster than every funny car, faster than anything else that was there. And this was his final year in this go-kart. 1973, he finishes the year. The Amelie Oil had come to uh, had come to an end. Um, he had offers from all over the place to sell the rocket cart because it was so popular. So he did. He sell he sold it to some guys who changed the name. Um, continued to run the cart, but they just they changed the name to Free Spirit or something like that, and they and they ran it. Um, you know, it's the same type of an act, but it was the same deal. And the interesting thing is, uh, he made enough money uh, selling the go kart and the act and all of it that went along with it. Um, it had appeared in all kinds of magazines and stuff. Um, he used that money to buy a boat, and he turned that boat into a wildly successful charter fishing and service business back. And by the 1980s, he was a millionaire, wealthy man. Um, he's also a guy that has made the millions and lost the millions and made them back again. And the neatest part of this story is the fact that just a few years ago, in his mid-80s, he got the go-kart back. It didn't get destroyed. It had been kept. It had been not necessarily maintained, but it was intact. And he got it back. And then he actually ran it again. Now, remember I told you it's impossible to get the hydrogen peroxide rocket fuel here in the United States because you can't get the purity level of it. No one even has it here. There's no real industrial use for it. But in Europe, they still have pretty open access to it. At least access that if you have the right connections, you can get the stuff. There's a man in France named Eric Taboul that runs a rocket-powered, hydrogen peroxide rocket-powered motorcycle, and he makes exhibition runs with it, has run in the low fives in the quarter mile on this thing. It is the quickest thing in the history of drag racing on two wheels. And several years ago, Eric Taboul was invited to the United States to run his rocket motorcycle. And when he came here, he came here with hundreds of gallons of hydrogen peroxide for Captain Jack McClure and some other racers that are trying to get the hydrogen peroxide rocket kind of back into the realm of public consciousness and drag racing and in motorsports for record chasing. So with the fuel and with the cart and with a age of roughly 87 to 88 years old, Jack McClure got on his go-kart and ran a couple of eighth mile passes. He went, I believe, in the fours in the eighth mile and was able to uh, <laughs> was able to relive his amazing life from 40 years ago was able to do it again or 50 years ago at this point was able to do it again in his 80s it's a neat story and the fact that the guy is still alive today it's amazing and he's got some great war stories too um you know one one of my favorites um this one is from empire dragway so i'm going to tell it in his own words i was running an ihra race early in the season the event happened to be in New York at Empire Dragway. I was going to do all the IHRA events that season. They were going to play up the fact that I was trying to hit 200 with the cart. Larry Carrier, the guy who ran IHRA, didn't want me to go out there and run 200 right off the bat. He wanted me to work up to it over the course of the weekend. Well, I launched off my first pass, and the track was smooth as glass, and I went through the lights at 215 miles an hour, and Carrier was pissed. He was screaming and yelling that I'd have to run that fast every run from now on. It wasn't much trouble for me to do that, but he was really mad. Anyway, I went down to the front office to get paid, and who was there but Shirley Muldowney? And I told her that she should make a run on the cart. She was lighter than me, and I thought the thing would be faster. Do you know what she said to me? F you. <laughs> and Shirley didn't just say it in the F you manner. She went full pull with the language. Finally, a chance encounter with the famous Big Willie Robinson, the street racer from California who eventually became a big figure in drag racing all across the country. I ran at US 30 Dragway all the time, as Jack tells us in his words. They had me there a lot. One event was supposed to be me facing off with Art Arfons and his jet car head-to-head. -head. This was after Arfons had the accident that killed a reporter, so he was not happy running side-by-side -side with me. We told the track operator that we were going to run separately, and the guy running the track panicked and told us there was going to be a riot. The whole place was gambling on the race, and there was big money riding on either me or Art to win, and unless we found a way to have a winner, there was going to be big trouble. We went on the PA and told the folks we were going to run one at a time, and whoever had the low ET would be the winner, and everybody seemed okay with that. Art went down the track, and I knew I could beat him. 
I went shooting off and made a clean run. Part of my show was getting towed back up the track and waving to the fans. As I was being towed back, I recognized that the place was dead silent, and I thought we were in for it. I stopped in front of the stands, and you could hear a pin drop. I thought something really bad was about to happen. Big Willie Robinson, now this guy went about 6'6", six, six, and was, six, six, it was built like a Greek god, hoisted me up on his big shoulders, and the announcer screamed, Now! And the place went nuts. I was really thinking we were done for, and they had just declared me the winner. Captain Jack is filled with stories like this to this day, still living a great life, still uh, for his age, very happy, very with it, and capable of reliving some of those great, great kind of moments from his life and career. If you've seen the pictures of the man on the rocket go-kart, now you know the story of the man on the rocket go-kart. He's one of my favorite people. He is a great guy, and his story is incredible. From that dirt track in Columbia or Columbia Speedway down there in South Carolina to becoming one of the most famous motorsports personalities in the world to simply going off into the ocean and making millions as a boat captain and fishing charter guy, he really has lived the lives of 10 men. And now you know the story of Captain Jack McClure and his hydrogen peroxide-powered rocket cart. And if you don't believe any of this, you should, because it's all true, it's all documentable, and it can all be found if you do some pretty easy Google image searching. We'll be back with more next time on the Dorkomotive Podcast. Maybe it'll be a story about a person, maybe it'll be a story about a car, maybe it'll be a story about some sort of weird machine. But you know it's going to be interesting here at Dorkomotive. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.